Welcome back to the second part of a two-part series on John Lowe. I'm joined by Jasper Miners and the legend that is Bob Crosby from the USGA. Bob is literally writing the book on this subject right now and on this amazing man. And if you haven't listened to part one, please go back and listen to part one. It will set a lot of the scenes that we'll be discussing in part two. I hope you enjoy. I mean, the game is an amateur game. I mean, the professional side of it, you know, there are idols and heroes and fun to watch them play. But I mean, if it wasn't for amateur golf, there would be no golf. On a nice day, it's very scoreable. When you go play it on a you know, 15, 20 mile an hour day and you're, you're hanging on to your pants. And I think I love that about that style of golf, Link style of golf. You have to remember when you play a golf course and you're out there for four hours or whatever, you're only hitting the you're only hitting a ball for what fifteen minutes of that, so there's a lot of time to look around. And golf Club Atlas is, is an amazing resource. One of the reasons it's an amazing resource is I forget who started this. Somebody started posting drawings of early American golf courses. This is beginning of say 1890 or so. And he posts them up into World War One, some maybe a bit later. Every every single one of them. And I, I have not found an exception to date. And there, these are dozens of golf courses have a series. They're, they're designed around a series of cross bunkers. Every hole, if it's not a bunker, it's a road. If it's not a road, it's a creek or a, or, or a mound or something. But the idea was to test the, the point of golf was to carry hazards. And that was the binary test. And there's more to it than that. And I, 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 you, I'll, I'll bore your listeners silly if I get into no, it. No, not at all. This is fascinating. But, but it, it, that was the test. It took Lowe about seven or eight years to figure out what it was about St. Andrews that made it a better kind of golf course. Because it wasn't at all obvious to anybody. Back up a second. Purvis sets out in 18, uh, 1890 a set of 12 principles of golf course design. They basically say what we've been talking about, about cross hazards and hole links and things like that. It was, and this is the surprising thing to me, and I'd be happy to be told I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. It was the first articulation of golf, uh, principles of golf architecture ever. Tom, Tom, old Tom Morris did a lot of golf courses. If he, if, he was, if he was following some sort of principle in the way he designed those golf courses, he never said it, what it was, never wrote about it. Uh, lots of people, a lot of golf courses were built uh, before Sandwich, but nobody had ever articulated a set of design principles. Purvis did. It threw everybody, particularly conservative Scottish golfers, on their heels. They were wrong-footed. They didn't, know, they didn't know what to say because there was no precedent for it. There was no precedent for it. So they had to make, they had to make, they had to figure out how do you respond to Purvis. It took Lowe until 1901 to come up with uh, an alternative theory of golf architecture. And it turns out that the theory he comes up with is still at the heart of strategic golf architecture. Still mm-hmm. the, the motivating dynamic that, that you see in modern golf courses. Do you want to explain what that is? Yes. Thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, Lowe argues in 1901 that there are two ways to think of how, the, how golf is best played. Lowe was such a good writer. So one way is to think the, 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 the way you should play golf is to hit balls over hazards. Okay, he said there's another way to play golf, which is to place your shots in proper places, which make the which make the next shot easier. And he said. St. Andrews is a course where that's the case, where the idea is there there are very few occasions in St. Andrews where you have to carry a bunker, but you do have to put your ball in the right spots to open up the green to the next shot down the right hand side pretty much every single right. <laughs> and, and and that simple contrast between a golf course that wants you to carry hazards versus a golf course that wants you to place your shots 
was the was the dagger to the heart of Victorian golf architecture. It never recovered. In fact, to this day, there are very, very few Victorian golf courses left. They just, they basically disappeared. They were overbuilt with, with the new ideas starting about 1910. And now they're very, very rare. There are very few in America, for, for example. There's one at Saratoga and there's one up uh, in Vermont, but uh, very few left. So just to, uh, to, to perhaps for our listeners, you know, crystallize this in their minds. So uh, Laidlaw Purvis in the 1890s, early 1890s, codifies golf course architecture, uh, Victorian penal golf, as, as it were. 1901, John Lowe writes an article. 1903, he writes his book. Uh, he's come from Scotland to Cambridge and perhaps not surprisingly, ends up at Woking Golf Club with perhaps many of his colleagues. Uh, of, yeah, it's of over 50%. Profession. Well, well if Bernard, if Bernard Darwin. It's, someone told me it's over 50% Scotsmen are still members of Woking. That's, well, that wouldn't surprise me in the least. Wouldn't surprise me in the least. Uh, and there's a famous story. I'm sorry, Jasper. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. No, no, so, yeah, no, quick, it was quick, just a question. Quick, of, quick, quick story. Um, okay. I'll remember, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> Lowe is, came, uh, Darwin is maybe five or six years younger than Lowe. Maybe it's more than that, seven or eight years younger than Lowe. Lowe was taking, Lowe was taking Darwin out to visit Woking. He, had, he hadn't been there before. This is in the 1890, late 1890s, I think. And they're taking the train. They, they get to Woking Station. And Darwin grabs his golf bag and starts running for a cab. And Lowe yells at him, says, gentlemen golfers don't run. Apropos <laughs> 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 of nothing. <laughs> it's a great story. So, so thinking about Woking then, so you, you've got uh, Darwin and Lowe. Uh, you've got Simpson, obviously, there. Patton as well is there. Now, we know the backdrop of the, the 1890s, uh, reeling from what effectively uh, Purvis has done. 1901, the article comes out. 1903, the book comes out. W when does it all kick off? This the the the, the touch point being the the center line bunker on the fourth at Woking. Um, now this is an interesting one because from the clubhouse you think to yourself it's a, it's a fair way because you play one short hole, par three across, then you play three back. But actually, if you walk from the clubhouse. The fourth hole isn't that <laughs> too far. Not that far, Not that far from no. the parking lot. Yeah. yeah. Right behind the, yeah, there's the parking lot. And then what is now the Greenkeepers, which probably wasn't there. Uh, right. And then you would hit the, the fourth tee. So w when did that all happen? Just to bring our listeners up to speed with, with the, the timeline of events. That, 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 that's actually a great question. Nobody, even at Woking, seems to know exactly when that happened. But it must have happened somewhere between 1900 and 1902. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 there, there were actually two or three changes to Woking that were revolutionary. One is the they had, they took the center line bunker on four, made it a center line uh, the, the cross bunker on four, made it a center line bunker, um, right where quote the good players wanted to hit their drives, and Lowe laughed at that. Um, <laughs> but 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 the other change was the famous Johnny Low bunker on the seventeenth hole which was contrary to Victorian uh, orthodoxy, was built into, well, they said, quote, into the green. It was built right on the green. The Victorian orthodoxy was, uh, if you build bunkers close to greens, that means almost good shots get penalized and worse shots don't get penalized at all because they're farther afield. So you don't build bunkers close to greens you know, on the fairness principle. Lowe said, no, <laughs> he said, said, no, that's not how, that's not how bunkers work. That's not how they work on the old course. And that's not how they're going to work at Woking. Um, all of which was very controversial. Uh, all of which had a profound effect on Tom Simpson who came out and saw what he wanted to know what the fuss was about. And when he saw those changes, that was, he says, at least that's when I, he decided to become a golf course architect, <laughs> but, uh, but but the, the, the question is when that happened. It's it, that's not uh, it's not clear to me, and I've 
looked for. It's just, I don't know, but it's sometime in that two year period. If, if I can add, Lowe was on a subcommittee that was charged in, in 1899 over the winter of 19, 1900 with adding bunkers to the old course. It was the first addition of any bunkers to the old course we had any record of. Wow. We, we have a record of some bunkers being removed in the 19th century, but no record of any new bunkers in the 19th century. Um, Low, as far as I can tell, basically had a very strong voice in that committee. They added uh, something like 25 bunkers, mostly all on the right side of the outgoing holes, of the outward holes. But that occasion, those deliberations, I think, caused him to think hard about what it was about bunkering at the old course that made it work so well versus the kind of bunkering Purvis wanted to build. And there was some talk in 1900 that the old course was becoming obsolete, that they needed to build you know, tier after tier of cross bunkers, just like Sandwich. And Lowe and others said, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. And but to but to make his argument, he had to say what it was they were trying to do otherwise. I mean, what kind of golf was was St. Andrews calling for that was different from sandwiches? And it gets back to the idea that St. Andrews asks you to place your ball and not hit over stuff. Um, and, and I think those deliberations about the bunkering at the old course had a profound effect on Lowe. And I think it, it, he carried them to Woking with him when uh, he was there confronted with a, a Tom Dunn Victorian golf course that I don't think he must have liked very much and decided and was given the leeway he and Patton uh, to make changes. How did the club react to his changes? <laughs> there are a number of accounts from Darwin who says it was people were furious, just furious, all kinds of country, all kinds of meetings, upset. They would have they would uh, go out together to look at the bunkers, uh, just furious, big boo ha ha. A couple of months later, people came back and said, you know, it sort of makes sense, it sort of makes sense. But it, it, but it, it was typical of Lowe that he would go and did it, and what the hell. So Woking, as I hear it, in terms of golf course architecture, is one of the most important things that going, one of the most important golf courses in history. I, th I think so, yeah. It yeah. Sounds, um, it's an inspiration for the people, um, a lot of the greats of, well, really the truly great first golf architecture, well, written down golf architecture era. I, I think that's a fair statement. Uh, remember that uh, Colt preceded uh, Lowe at Cambridge. They actually didn't play in the same golf team, but this is, I, I won't get into it. Lowe had to put off going to college for two years because of family issues. A father died, a brother died, there were all sorts of issues. So he put off, he would have been in the same class with Colt. They were in the same class joining the uh, uh, RNA in 1892, I think it was, that they were very close friends. Uh, and uh, I, I, there's little doubt in my mind that Lowe had a profound influence on Colt. Colt says so. Colt says so. So you have people like Colt, and um, you've got Colt Simpson. Bernard Simpson. Darwin talking very highly of you is instantly a winner. Don't 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 forget the Americans. Uh, C. B. McDonald was deeply influenced by Lowe. Walter Travis was deeply influenced by Lowe, and some of that was transmitted by just visits to the to the to the to Scotland and the U. K. In which Lowe accompanied them around certain golf courses, but I think a lot of it was transmitted by the what's now little understood and appreciated. Came, Oxford Cambridge golfing tour of America in, in, eight, in 1903, in which Lowe, Allison, and a bunch of people played golf with everybody that was anybody in American golf, including Travis, McDonald, Chandler Egan, uh, just go down the list. I mean, everybody. 
And I think they, they imparted to the Americans the new ideas about golf architecture that would, were developing in England at the time. The Americans were probably a decade or so behind Britain on golf architecture. And uh, I, I think it was, it was where there was a real shift of outlooks in, the, in, the, in America after that tour and after Lowe and Allison and others had, had uh, met with them. I've noticed one thing that uh, reoccurs, uh, reoccurs when you talk about these great golf architects in this era um, and the way that John Lowe obviously took his time writing down his reply. Um, it's very hard to articulate. Uh, fairness is very easy to articulate. Do you, uh, did that find? Did he find difficulty in that trying to translate his efforts across to people? You know, I, I think not. But, but I, I take your point, and, and it's a good one because I think most punters, and I include myself in that, um, find it much easier to think about concepts of fairness uh, and related topics when they talk about golf courses rather than I think these slight, it's only slightly more sophisticated talking about the strategic nature of various golf courses. And their default, default vocabulary tends to be in terms of moral issues. I wasn't treated fairly. I didn't earn this outcome. You know, I got, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't equitable. Um, low basically, and by the way, modern architects too, like Doak and Kuhn, and Crenshaw said, yeah, let's get this fairness stuff out of the vocabulary entirely. It, 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 it's really that helpful. It, it is slightly more hard to understand. Um, but I think if you put it in terms of, uh, of uh, it's a richer environment in which to play golf if you, have a, if you have a spectrum of choices in terms of your next shot, as opposed to you have one choice. Either you hit it over this hazard or you don't, or you, or you foozle it and hit it into the hazard. Um, and yeah, I know that one well, I, you know, the, the, well, yeah, I do too. The, <laughs> but, the, but, but, but the, the, the gentleman architects at the time picked up on low immediately. And that is Colt Simpson, slightly later McKenzie, um, uh, all immediately saw the significance for the profession of what Lowe was trying to say. It's unbelievable. It's like someone fiddling with a few windows in a building and becoming the most profound architect of all time. It's, um, <laughs> it's crazy, the idea of this man who put a changed a few bunkers and then created one of the greatest eras of all time, uh, probably the greatest golf era of all time. Well, don't get me wrong. It wasn't the change of the bunkers was part of it, but he also wrote prolifically at the time, although in mostly in periodicals. And for he wrote for the Atlantic News, uh, the, excuse me, the Athletic News. He wrote for the Pall Mall Gazette. I may be pronouncing that wrong. Um, uh, he wrote for uh, he wrote a lot in Golf Illustrated. Uh, he wrote his book, uh, uh, which the chapter on the links is is revolutionary. And then all along the way, he wrote, he, well, the Nesbitt's Golf Guide, which was an annual published every year from about 1904, I think it was 1904 till 1912, was his baby. And it contains some of the most fascinating articles on golf architecture. It contains, I think, the first golf course rating. He had two rating, he had two rating systems, one done by amateurs and one, one done by professionals. And... The amateurs all rated the old course number one by a long shot. The professionals didn't. It was way down the list somewhere. They like sandwich, by the way. Um, well, I, I was going to ask that. If we're on that topic, I, do you think that um, because the game has been, particularly in America, maybe not so much in the UK, has been very much defined by the professional game over the last 100 years, has created, has made fairness creep back in after low? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, in, in, you know, Tom Doak has written about this, which is in, in, in I, 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 having been on a Greens committee, I, I agree entirely that 
there's a lot of pressure from members at various clubs to make his course fair. They, they hate lies that, you know, they didn't think that, that they should have gotten that sort of thing. That's still very much around. And um, I think you could argue that there were two basic warring camps about the game and not just golf architecture, but the rules, do you regulate balls, that sort of thing. One was sort of the, the, uh, the sort of the Victorian, what low call it the equity party. And the other was uh, the conservatives, the Lowe's, the Colts, the McKenzie's, people like that. I think those two camps, which, which really began warring very clearly about 1900, those two camps are still going at it. They're it's, still there. That's They're a, still there. It's common not just in golf, but it's in every day it matters. Right. In everything. It, it's uh, and and uh, I mean I come down on the low McKinsey Colt side, but I, I think it's probably a minority view. Even though I think I'm right, it's a minority view. I think. Uh, I there has to be a big search. Sorry. Yeah, no. I was just going to ask, just as a you know, open some some brackets parentheses, if you will. Uh, we talk about Colt and Low uh, and Simpson. Uh, and you've got this commonality between world-class thinkers of the game and a, a, a common profession, um, whether barristers, solicitors, lawyers, <laughs> educated individuals of a certain type or persuasion. I've always wondered this and I've grappled with it and never had a satisfactory answer, or one that I could come up with anyways. Um, what was it, do you think, about the time perhaps that school of thought, maybe the secular training that these individuals had that allowed them to be such free thinkers uh, and perhaps what would appear to be go against perhaps the grain of law, order, codification. Science, it, it just science. seems like they're, they're not necessarily on a, a parallel line. Th that... How much time do we have? Uh, we <laughs> all the time in the world. It is, it is, I know it's late for you guys. Uh, but, wow, um, it doesn't bother me. Um, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> number one, there are two. There, there are two answers to that question. I think one is that we forget today of the huge divide between what we're called gentleman golfers and professional golfers. Um, you, you can see it in all the accounts of the game. The, the gentleman golfers were called Mr. Low. Varden was referred to just as Harry Varden. One had the Mr. Appellation, the other one didn't. There were, and it was two different worlds. One was educated and one was not. Well, at least that was the claim. And Views of golf tended to break down, not always, but tended to break down at the time along the lines of who went to Oxbridge and who didn't. Um, because they tended to have a more reflective, I guess is the word, view of the game. And it wasn't so much, I want to go out and shoot the lowest score possible. It's, I, I view golf as a fascinating, interesting challenge. That, that we need to make sure is attractive to all sorts of golfers all the time. There's a second part to you, and your, your question is, I think, a very deep, serious one. There's a second part of the answer. It would probably have to go something along the lines of Queen Victoria dies in 1901. The Edwardian age comes in right behind that. You go from an era of a progressive Victorian era that put morality and order as, as, as the most important things a society should aim towards. And then by after Queen Victoria dies, you be entered an Edwardian age in which simple pleasure is, is enough. Just a fun golf course is justifies itself by virtue of its fun. There's pleasurable. That was unheard of, unheard of in the Victorian era. And so you, but which begs the other question, well, why the change right for Queen Victoria does? I don't have a good answer to that. But, the, but there's no question that there's a different social ethos post-Victoria. 
And part of that is low, Cole, McKenzie, those guys. Uh, it, 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 they're all young. They're all well-educated. Um, and they basically set the foundations for what we call today the a golden age of golf course architecture, which at least we can quibble about the start dates, but it was certainly in the 1920s. And that's when they were in their heyday. Uh, it's, it, don't it, forget, they had to take a Scott to start an idea, right? That's it, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Takes a Scott to be the... <laughs> so it, 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 it's uh, one of the fun things and also one of the most difficult things about trying to write this book is you get into those social historical issues because both Lowe and the people he was arguing against, which is Purvis and others, were deeply embedded in their own times, in their own, in their own social milieu. And, it, 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 you know, it, and their battle over golf is a microcosm of larger battles going on in British society at the time. There, there's almost, it's almost a seamless, a seamless continuation of larger cultural battles going on at the time. And it's just, it's fascinating. That is fascinating. Um, right, okay, so probably the most relevant thing in discussion right now is the ball rollback, uh, particularly with it coming in in a year and a half or so. But we know that uh, from our earlier discussions that uh, John Lowe had the exact same problems with the equipment of his day. Uh, do you want to elaborate on uh, what challenges he faced rather than the modern day? Sure. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Haskell ball shows up in Britain in the fall of 1901. It's viewed initially as just a novelty item, but it very, very quickly catches on. It mes most estimates have it added about 20 yards to the drive. Um, low saw immediately, Lo was a very smart guy, Lowe saw immediately the threat it posed to traditional golf courses and thought it ought, that, that, that initially he thought that the, it ought to be outlawed, that the gutty should be the standardized ball for the game. Recall that there were no rules about balls at all until 1923. None. So that you you could you could you people played golf and this includes Jones back in the day. Well, I'm sorry, Jones would have been after some of these ball regulations came in. But you but typically you played with a large ball to play downwind. You would play a small ball to play into the wind. You'd play a heavy ball for, <coughs> for dry turf. You'd play a larger ball that's easier to hit out of the rough. And so they would carry thirty or forty balls, and they weren't just they they were seven or eight different types of balls. All of that was perfectly legal. There was no rules about golf, golf balls. Um, <laughs> Lowe, felt, Lowe felt that the Haskell presaged further developments in ball technology that would further render obsolete traditional golf courses. Couldn't have been more right about that. Um, by... On the eve of World War I, there is a growing consensus that something needs to be done about the ball because it's going too far. World War, I, World, World War I comes and all that's put on hold. Lowe is at the time chairman of the Rules Committee. Uh, they come back after the war and Lowe says first order of business is to let's create a rule about balls. And they come up with the Max Men rule, which we still have which was to say it can't be any smaller than X or way more than Y. Um, there were different iterations of it at the time. But that was the rule they passed in 1920. I think it was effective in 1921, I think. Um, he and, and Arthur Kroon, who was on the committee as well, worked very closely with the ball manufacturers in 1921 to set a, to set a standard that would work for their manufacturing facilities. There was a very cooperative effort. And the manufacturers assured low that this was it. This was pretty much as far as the ball is going to be able to go. 
And so Lowe announces with the, with the promulgation of the rule that, well, we finally licked the ball. I'm just delighted. And I'm going to retire now. He did retire. <laughs> it turned out the man, ball manufacturers were lying. Um, they could take the max men rules and build a much, much longer ball, which they did. And through the 20s, there were continuing debates about what to do with the ball. But Lowe died in 1929. I think it was from a throat cancer. He was 59 years old. Bitter about that. Very sad about that. Because he thought he had tamed it. And he didn't. Um, it turns out we still have it. But, but that was, the, that was the, towards the end of his life, the big issue for him. Um, and he felt he failed and he felt he got lied to and he did um, because of, they, they were trying to set a standard the ball manufacturers would use as the sort of the last gasp of ball technology and that just didn't happen so uh, he fought bitterly he lost friends over it um, but uh, for 20 years so and if that was the, the situation with the ball, Bob, well, with regards to clubs, well, we know they, there is a, a progression from perhaps the long nose to something that would resemble, say, an early persimmon of sorts, uh, nowadays a more modern looking club. But where, where was low on, on that? On well, the, you know, the, 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 this, this is pre-low. The, you know, the, there was a bulger that was invented by probably Willie Parkinson. But they disputed who, but the bulger, the face of the, the convex face of the driver, kept. We still, we still use that to some extent. But that's that's pre-low. The the uh, the issue for the big issue for Lowe was was Walter Travis's winning the 1904 amateur at Sandwich using a Schenectady putter, which Brits thought was cheating. Um, it was a center shafted putter. Which meant the that the the the, ang the face angle meant less. You could because it was, you, you hit the ball at the shaft, so you could. Um, and the Brits banned that. The, the Americans objected and did not ban it. The interesting thing to me is that Lowe was such a conservative and such a powerful man in the RNA that even though the USGA about sometime in the mid twenties, I I don't have the exact dates, uh, basically said steel shafts are legal. And the RNA, because of Lowe's adamant opposition, did not make them legal until after Lowe died. The other thing they waited till after Lowe died to do was to adopt the 14 club rule. Lowe apparently carried 30 or 40 clubs. <laughs> uh, um, so the RNA was behind the USGA, I think, on both of those issues, but it was primarily the legacy of Lowe. They, they wanted to get him dead and buried before they dared <laughs> authorize steel shafts and that sort of thing. Well, he seems to be quite a force of nature, uh, John Lowe. And how, uh, how do you think he would deal with things if you exhumed him and brought him back alive and sat him in the RNA Rules Committee right now? What a great question. He, would, he, would, he is spinning in his grave right now. Um, any rule and... The, the, what was it three or four years ago when the, the fiasco at Oakmont where where Johnson ball moved and said he didn't it didn't move and the one I forget which green it was on they have since changed the rule to say that when you address the ball if you didn't intend to move the ball it's not a rules violation Lowe would be going what are you guys doing it, you know, intent has nothing to, it, it makes enforcement of the rules subject to an interpretation of a situation that's impossible to do well, because I can't get in his head. And, and uh, if you address the ball, the ball moves, that's the penalty. End of questions. And I mean, he would, he would, and there's fairness is creeping into the rules as well, which he would strongly object to. I've got a really good example of this, but it's a completely different sport. Football or your soccer, look how often people dive in that sport because they've tried to make it as fair and intent-based as all. Um, and that diving has caused a lot of trouble within the sport. Oh, I, I know, no doubt. Absolutely. I, you know it better than I, but but uh, I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. They're just... They're, 
USGA rules decisions after rules decisions, I'm thinking Lowe would be very upset about this. And I basically agree with him. I mean, you, you, I think you now have rules that are trying to be so sensitive to the players' concerns. And these are mostly professional players' concerns that the enforceability of the rules is, is jeopardized. I mean, the, the simple application of the rules is very hard because you have to make an assessment of intent. And that's impossible. Know, it's, 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 it's hard. Not impossible, but it's hard, yeah. Without mind reading, a lot of the time, yeah, a good actor can get away with these things, right? So it's uh, he he would be uh, and, and and the big the big drivers and all that stuff today he he'd be wagging his finger saying, "Come on, guys, I told you so. This is you know you know you know come on." <laughs> it's true though. It's it it, it, it really is true. I mean, so it, what's the, amazing? Go ahead. No, I said what's amazing is that you have this individual who was a force when it came to equipment, uh, balls and clubs, an individual who was a force when it came to rules, and you have an individual who was a force when it came to golf course architecture. Uh, and actually, uh, whilst he would be you know, perhaps not uh, impressed with where the game is at with regards to rules, balls and equipment, uh, the legacy that he set is probably had the biggest impact on the game and, and was its greatest contribution. The fact that he made golf, what it is, strategic golf made it fun. And because it's fun and challenging and exciting, it, it grew to the masses. Uh, and it's probably the greatest legacy that he gave. But unfortunately, um, up until now, perhaps the spotlight hasn't been shone on him as much as it should be, which is great because obviously we, we wait with bated breath for the publication could date. Yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 there are contingencies in history. I don't want to sound too academic, but, but there are contingencies in history, which if things had turned out slightly differently would have changed the kind of game we're familiar with today. For mm -hmm. example, if the British Golf Union had been formed and taken over rules administration, we would have a very different looking rule book right now. If the legacy of Sandwich had continued unabated, we would have very different looking golf courses today. If Lowe hadn't been able to impose some sort of limit on the ball, even though he felt it failed, but he, he established a precedent that you could, in theory, write a rule that limited golf balls. Um, if that hadn't happened, Lord knows. I mean, some of this might have happened eventually in a different way with different people, but it happened when it did, and largely because of low, uh, you know, the first several decades of the 20th, 20th century turned out the way they did, which is the legacy we live with now in golf. Um, but it, the, 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 things could have turned out very differently. You could argue that um, right now we're having a second turn towards low, um, Lowe's ideals, which is my ideals were very similar. Lowe's a bit of a hero to me um, in his outlook on the world. But uh, what did he get wrong? What did he get wrong in, in his opinions in golf? Ooh, that's... Well, let me just, I'll check out. He, 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 was, he was the reason that golf didn't, what didn't become part of the Olympics, and it's only recently been reinstated into the Olympics. Um, I think that was probably wrong. I don't know. I don't have strong feelings about whether golf the Olymp should be in the Olympics or not, but he, he was adamantly opposed to that. Um, he, he was, a, he, he, uh, I thought he was too, con too conservative on a number of rules issues. For example, the history of the casual water rule is now called something else. Was it standing water or something? I forget that it was called. But, but, but he, he was completely opposed to any relief from casual water. He was completely opposed to any relief from stymies. Um, both of those rules were obviously changed. Um, so he, I think he was wrong. He, he, was, he was over the top on some stuff. I'll forgive him that for the big picture that he got right, I thought. 
I still play stymies sometimes. It's fun. <laughs> I've never, you know, I've never played stymies. Um, I'd like to do it. There, there were, there were all sorts of, the, 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 the ink spilled on the stymie question from about 1895 to about 1915 is just mind numbing. It's just oh, I can imagine. unbelievable. There'll be a lot, lot of it. So, I mean, and you know, one, one of the problems with writing about the rules is, is you, one of the initial reactions you get from people is this sort of eye roll of I'm so over it kind of thing. You know, it's mm. just, oh, please don't. But they really are fact. They're at least if you get into them a little bit, in, in particularly into a specific rule and its and its sort of vicissitudes through time, it really is as fascinating as golf architecture because because they're the same basic issues. Is it fair? Should it be fair? Does it matter if it's fair? What you know? What are the outcomes? And, and, and you know, the casual water rules is is got a wonderful history that I want to write about. But it's. Uh, because the U.S. Well, I'll spare you the details of that. But 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 um, no no let's let's go for it. Well, the the, the the USGA when it promulgates its first set, USGA by the way was a golf union, and um, that that and it got its ideas from Laidlaw Purvis. That's how you set up a golf union. Um, mm. So uh, <laughs> he's the he's the, he's the, 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 the nemesis. Um, but they they basically tracked the St. Andrews rules with one well, well there were a couple of exceptions, but one of the exceptions was the casual water rule. They said you get a free drop, no closer to the hole, out of casual water. And that was a debating point for the next ten or fifteen years until the RNA finally adopted the USGA rule. Um, but it, it uh, but that doesn't begin to scratch the surface, I don't think of the interesting arguments back and forth about why relief granted shouldn't be given. Why relief shouldn't be given. Uh, Lowe had very strong views about that. C.B. McDonald, who basically wrote the American rules, had very strong feelings about that on the other side, um, although they were pretty close friends. Um, so it, it, that, that's, that's the sort of back and forth I think ought to be written more about. Again, to repeat myself, because the issues involved at bottom are the same as the issues at bottom of golf architecture. I believe uh, one of the arguments that C. B. McDonald put across about the uh, unfairness of the first, uh, was it amateur championship, U.S. amateur, that didn't actually count, was, be <laughs> was because of um, was because there was a bunker that was in perfect driving distance. Well, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen that. Uh, yeah. I might be wrong, but. Well, I, I, I don't know about that. He, CB was a strong personality to understand <laughs> grossly. Um, he, uh, he, he, he was not going to accept any winner of the U.S. Open until it was him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but the, but the, the story, the, 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 I'm, I'm being harsh on him. There was a quote U.S. Open tournament held. I think it was 1895, and all the, this is at the time all these debates about Bridge Golf Union are going on. By the way, and McDonald says, "Well, that's not really a U.S. Open championship because there was no U.S. Open because there was no USGA formed at the time." And so he yeah. after after he wins the first Open that fall. Uh, he organizes with five other clubs, the USGA, it's, you know, the American Golf Union, and then conducts a tournament that he wins uh, officially. Um, so in fairness to McDonald, there was the, the, the existence of the USGA had to precede the existence of its open championship. So there was a, the other one that I liked from that was the fact that uh, apparently someone putted like a pool cue. Like who? Like a pool cue, like oh, pool. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Just a rumor. I, I, I haven't seen that, but I, I know that there have been people who tried to do that, and yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened. I mean, the, you, the, there was some notion that it wasn't a golf stroke. It, it actually pays off to go back and read that stuff, you know, because it's, it's, and first of all, they're beautiful writers. They're all 
classically educated and it's not dead. This is not like you're looking at sort of an old physics that's been superseded by Newton or superseded by Einstein. This is still living stuff that the issues are still very much alive and are, and, and are not resolved. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing how we haven't advanced in any way. Right. That just shows you how much it is to warring camps because no one can agree. No one can agree. I mean, the, the identity of the game is always up for grabs. Everybody, and, and it, it, which is one why we love it so much because it, it, it's, it's from year to year, not entirely clear what the identity of the game is. Um, Lowe had his ideas. Purvis had his ideas. Different professionals had their ideas. Um, but uh, it, it's never been entirely resolved. And maybe further to your point, Bob, that's uh, maybe a really nice way, way, way to put it too or think about it is that back in the day, there was a willingness of mainstream media, these periodicals, that, that would publish these letters from individuals who had their various, you know, axes to grind on their side of the conversation, whatever it might have been. But the, the conduit to get that to the masses, they, they were a willing party in that to provide differing points of view. Uh, where that has now ceased, you know, everything is down the line. We're very central, you know, as long as no one's offended by anything, we'll, we'll just kind of take that tack. But perhaps that's also this proliferation, to your point, of things like podcasts, microbloggers, Twitter accounts, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, perhaps it's just a, a, instead of going through that central funnel of a, a mainstream periodical, we actually have, instead of one, one large conduit, we have perhaps many smaller ones. Uh, but there does seem to be a a small shift towards people who are thinking about these things again, um, which is nice. I, I think you're right. I think I think the, the the modern social communication stuff you can bypass the main the main the media is dying. I mean, you know, I keep I get golf illustrate golf uh, digest and golf magazine here in the states, and they're just they're dead. They're dead. But podcasts your podcast, other people's podcast, um, actually have some interesting idiosyncratic voices, um, which are worth listening to. There's, uh, um, there's one last thing I would like to ask you. Sure. Not let, you're not getting away without this, okay? Everyone has to answer it. And okay. It doesn't have to be five, but can you give me your five favorite golf courses? Not best, your favorite ones, the ones that mean the most to you. Uh, five. It doesn't have to be five. I had someone say 13 once, so. <laughs> um, so old course, um, Augusta National that I've been fortunate enough to play several times. Um, um, Myopia, which my golf team, that was our home course. Um, boy. Um, Athens Country Club. I need, that, I need a fifth, right? You don't have to have a fifth. You can leave uh, that one open. Shit, I mean, Cyprus, but who's there? Everybody wants Cyprus. I, you know. <laughs> Enjoyed it, guys. Really fun. Yeah, that was great. Thanks so much. Yeah, Bob. We'll bring you back on for your book. Genuinely, Bob, thank you very much for giving us your time. I know you're the busiest man in the world right now with the new museums being opened, and it means a lot that you could educate us on such a special man. We'll give all you guys an update on timings and dates for Bob's book whenever it comes out. Thank you very much to all of you for listening to this two-part episode. We can't do it without you, so please subscribe, rate us, share, do all of that. If you want to get in touch, please go on to our social media platforms, official top 100 on Instagram and top 100 golf courses and not everything else. Or just get in touch with me directly. It's james at top100golfcourses.com. And please remember, play fast, lunch slow.